if you try to do it on your own and don't practice self-care and get the support that you need, you're going to probably burn out. And especially for over 70 years of age, all caregivers for dementia, about two-thirds predecease the person they're caring for. That's tragic and it's preventable. Welcome to Aging in Style with me, Lori Williams. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe you can follow your dreams at any age. My grandmother's journey with dementia ignited a passion in me to work with seniors. I've spent the past 13 years learning about seniors and aging. In my mid-50s, I followed my own dream and founded my company, where I use my expertise to help seniors locate housing and resources. On this podcast, we cover all aspects of aging. Join us each week to meet senior living experts and inspirational seniors who are following their dreams. The fact is, we're all aging, so why not do it in style? Hi, welcome to Aging in Style. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about caregiving, but caregiving from the male perspective. We've talked about it from the female perspective because most caregivers are female. So that's why we usually do that. But today we want to hear the male perspective on caregiving. And we have Bill Cohen as our guest. He is a caregiver, support leader, and speaker, a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association and owner of Cohen Caregiving Support Consultants. He lives in the Portland, Oregon area, and he has walked this journey of caregiving with his mother. He's going to share his story with us on how he became her caregiver and what that journey looked like. So thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Hi, Laurie. I'm excited. It's an honor to be here today. Oh, thank you so much. Well, we've talked a little bit pre-show, and it's just a very interesting story you have. So why don't we just kind of start from the beginning with your mom and what was going on? Sure. It's a touching, it's a gut-wrenching, it's an emotional subject and journey, but I'm happy to talk about it so others learn from it. And I like to say that if you had told me about 16 to 18 years ago, what was going to transpire? And I'd be sitting here talking to you today and doing what I do. I'd say, no way. Mm -hmm. That's just unthinkable. So I'm in Portland, Oregon, as you said. My mother had moved down to Biloxi, Mississippi, was living there for about 30 years. And in the early 2000s, she was showing some signs of something and we weren't sure what. Mood swings, agitation, confusion, paranoia, uh, not taking care of the house, not taking care of the finances, something she was really good at. And we knew something was wrong, but we weren't sure what. And we did even get her on one of the dementia medications that really don't help much, unfortunately. But we were thinking that if my stepfather passed away, because he had a lot of problems, he was on hospice, uh, emphysema, and all kinds of uh, issues. Or if he went on hospice or passed away, would she bounce back? Was she just getting stressed? Was she just overwhelmed? Was she just aging a bit more? And we didn't get an opportunity. Because as I know, you know, what Mm -hmm. happened on August 29th, 2005 on the Gulf Coast. Absolutely. Hurricane Katrina. The home they had lived in for about 30 years was completely swept away in the storm surge down to the foundation. Mm. She had evacuated, fortunately, beforehand, but she fully expected to come back to that house. The trauma of seeing it gone accelerated and exacerbated whatever was going on with her. We realized later it was Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But at that point, we weren't sure. It became much more apparent in the days after. So she ended up in North Carolina with step family after evacuating, went back and visited her numerous times. But very shortly after the storm, this is part of the story, and it illustrates the disease very vividly. And we had a very close relationship, but it was very challenged in this day. She was out in the driveway trying to escape from that step family. She did not get along very well with my Mm stepbrother. And fortunately, some other family member got her on the phone and said, Sheila, my mother's name, you need to get back in that house because you may end up somewhere you don't want to be, like institutionalized. Fortunately, she got the message. She still Mm -hmm. had enough cognition. I was on the next plane I could catch to Wilmington, North Carolina, I arrived. She was calmer. She was happy to see me. We have always had a very close, loving relationship, which is nice. And 
I said, what I, I use the term, instead of not uh, therapeutic lying, compassionate deception. <laughs> because I was, without causing any harm, I wasn't giving her the full facts. I was saying, mom, we're going to go see a new doctor tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's nice. No, we were going to the ER. Yeah. I was going to have her seen by a geriatric psychiatrist or a physician and get her on some medication because she was totally agitated. Those 10 hours in the ER in an adjoining conference room until she could be seen, hardest emotional night of my life. Mm. It was like a caged animal, the distress, the pain, the tension in her face was just, it was gut-wrenching what we see. But make a long story short, she finally got seen, admitted. I come back the next morning. I come off the elevator and she says, there you are. There's my savior. Aww. It wasn't angry at me. It mm-hmm. was just that's what was causing it. And that mm-hmm. persisted over the years. She'd have her moments, and I knew it wasn't personal. I learned that lesson, let's put it that way. So she was on the East Coast further uh, with another family member in Florida. I'm working full time. I'm doing cross country travel. I'm doing the, uh, the long distance caregiving and all the issues I had to deal with in the, of her health and the aftermath of the hurricane. So you can imagine where my stress level was, yeah. uh, not to mention having a narcissistic micromanager boss <laughs> that didn't help either. No. Uh, before she, while she was still cognitively able and still ambulatory, we did move her out here to Oregon. She had separated from my stepfather. I had a, ca- a care community in mind. I had been going to a support group, things like that. So move her out here in 2008. Uh, she was at this uh, very good nonprofit, faith-based care community, less than a year in assisted living as expected, and then four years in memory care. Mm-hmm. She passed away about nine and a half years ago at age 83. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and what I like to say is, and we can get more into what I do now, that I turn my loss, my pain into my passion and my encore career. Absolutely. I I love that. And I find a lot of people in senior living, a lot of people I interview have found this as their encore career. They found a passion and it's usually because they took care of a parent, a grandparent, um, you know, a family member, even a friend. And you just realize that there is so much information, so much knowledge that you gain by being the caregiver and then you can share and help someone else. So I'm glad that you've taken such a difficult you know, journey and turned it into something positive. Give us a little bit, some tips, maybe someone in your shoes, you know, especially, you know, from the male perspective, what are some, mm-hmm. some tips that you would share on, you know, how to maybe manage care and behaviors if, if their mom or dad or some family member has dementia or Alzheimer's? A little bit of background in terms of male caregivers. And uh, first of all, there was never any doubt in my mind when these things started developing, including the, uh, the, the disaster and her progression of her disease, that I was going to take on that role. Mm-hmm. I, did, I was fortunate that I had support of uh, my two aunts or sisters and other family members all helping in various ways, which is good. We know it's not always that case, and I help no. a lot of families try to get all on the same page. Uh, and a lot of that, again, had to do with my background, including financial services and government and that type of thing. I was the oldest son. I have a younger brother. And there was never any doubt that this was something that I was going to do as things developed. And even though it was gut-wrenching and hard and emotional, it was also gratifying. Mm-hmm. And I've heard this from uh, many people may have heard of Tipa Snow. She's very well known as a dementia trainer. And the last time I saw her here in Portland, she said, and I saw this myself back around the mid 2000s, it was like one out of every five caregivers was male. Now it's like one out of three. More and more men are stepping into that role. Wow. Uh, and I'm seeing this in my clients. I'm seeing this in my support groups as well, mm-hmm. which is good. But They come from a different perspective and a different upbringing. Women are traditionally in the caregiving role for children or other family members, being more nurturing, uh, just handling those kind of tasks differently. Men, when they're in that role, if they take it on 
at all, because too often in families, it falls upon a sister or a younger, another fa family member who's female. Men take it as more as a task, a job, a series of things that they need to do. And they tend to not seek help, not seek support. I can handle it. I can do this. I like to give the example of one client. Coincidentally, his wife was a gerontologist, <laughs> and she had even subbed for my first support group that I attended, first attended 16 years ago and still lead today, same group. <laughs> but she had Alzheimer's, and it was starting to come on. He wasn't seeking help. He was a, he was a mess. Mm -hmm. And I asked him a very blunt question. I said, is it that you think you're the only one who can handle it or do it right? You don't want to admit that you can't do it? Do you have control issues? <laughs> Are you in denial? And he said, all the above. <laughs> Fortunately, he hired me and I helped him through it in court conjunction with a couple of his family members bringing in help. He, he, she didn't want to be noticed or mm -hmm. recognized by a home care person or a care community person. He hid that in hers and protected her as long as possible. Eventually, it became a moot point. She was not aware. So she did end up going into a care community. So he did not seek help on his own. And too many men are that way. I have one client right now where he talked to me about three years ago about his wife's declining health and advancing uh, dementia. But he didn't seem ready because I didn't hear from him for a couple of years that he got back in touch with me last year and about some of the behaviors and how it's affecting their marriage. And I think I might have to put her into care community. How do I handle all these things? But more than anything, I think he just needed someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. Very often I've had people say, I have a therapist. But you've been there. You understand, though. And I need somebody like you to talk to. So that's so very do you, helpful. Do you find men don't seek out like support groups like women do? Right. And uh, it's, again, mm -hmm. it's increasingly uh, where they are. There are okay, in some cities, some male only groups, and they may feel more comfortable there. But mm -hmm. my groups, all three of them that I lead, all ages, all relationships, all genders, all types of dementia, all stages. Everybody's welcome. So mm -hmm. I have from people in their 30s to their 80s and all genders. So it, it's very interesting. And I think they realize that it, it's a safe environment. It's confidential. It helps uh, provide support, information, things like that. I make sure people understand they'll all due respect to 12-step programs. Might be right for some people. This is not that. We do mm -hmm. talk among ourselves, provide help and support, and it's still confidential within the group, of course. Mm -hmm. so, so more and more men are stepping into that role, but it's still the minority. Yeah, absolutely. What advice would you give men just to kind of move past thinking the, the denial and it may be, maybe they're embarrassed about it. Would you say that? They're kind of embarrassed that they can't handle it and their emotions, but just kind of move past it and seek out a support group, whether that could be, I know here in the Dallas area, there are some support groups through churches. There's also a, many, many support groups through the Alzheimer's Association, which we send people to all the time. But is that what you would do to seek, seek out help? That was one of the first things I did after the storm and went on the Alzheimer's Association website and started getting information that way and educating myself. I didn't go crazy with it. I was living through it. Mm -hmm. But between the two sources, that helped me learn a lot and learn how to handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, it because unfortunately, we can't fix it. We can't correct it. We can't cure it yet. We're getting closer. And that's hard for some people to deal with. They want to. Said, isn't there some magic bill? Isn't there something that, oh, they're, they're more alert today. Maybe they're getting better. No, unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. And if you try to do it on your own and don't practice self-care and get the support that you need, you're going to probably burn out. And especially for over 70 years of age, all caregivers for dementia, about two-thirds predecease the person they're caring for. 
that's tragic and it's preventable. Mm -hmm. And that is so true. I wonder also with, like you said, women, just historically, we've been the caregivers and men always do like to fix things. So they want to come in and we're going to fix this. And they come from that perspective. Like, let's just, we're going to fix all this. Everything's going to, and that's not what happens with Alzheimer's. Exactly. So yeah, the more you get tools and learn ways to manage the care and manage the behaviors. Uh, I don't like to say they are like children. They are childlike behaviors at times. I mean, if some if somebody's throwing a tantrum, what does that sound like? A bit like a two-year-old, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes you don't react. Sometimes you step away for a moment and wait for this, the mood to, to change. I did that with my mom. Like I said, we had a very close, loving relationship. And she'd be like this at me and even raise her fist occasionally. I think it was just more out of frustration than anything mm-hmm. else. Again, I didn't take it personally. And I said, okay, I'll be back in a few minutes, mom. And I went and stepped outside for a little bit. Come back. Ah, oh, there you are. I missed you. So mm-hmm. one of the best yeah. phrases I heard from the support group years ago was, don't worry if I think get mad at you because a few minutes later, an hour later, the next day, you can start all over again. They don't mm-hmm. remember. It. It's all brand new. Yeah. I like what you say. You, you, know, you said that a couple of times that you just never took it personally. And I think that is key. You can't take it personally because they would be, I'm sure, horrified to know how they were acting. They don't, they can't control it. They don't know what they're saying. And then if they were, you know, I would think right now, you know, I would never say such and such to my daughter or my son. But if I had dementia, I can't control that. And I would hope that they would understand it's not, it's not personal, you know? So I think mm-hmm. that's really key for again, people to take that away. Yeah. Again, we can't fix it. And we mm-hmm. want to, we want to make it better, especially if you have that strong nurturing side. We're not used to that. We're saying, oh, you've got a cold, I'll give you some Vicks Vapor Rub and some vitamin C and things like that and chicken soup. And <laughs> <laughs> There's no fix in that. Yeah, those yeah. things won't hurt with Alzheimer's, but no, it's not going to cure it. Exactly. So when we talk about self-care for the caregiver and not neglecting their health, and, and you hit on it exactly that. So many times we hear the caregiver, the one taking, uh, you know, doing everything for the person with dementia, they're the ones who ends up passing first. And a lot of times in what I do, we run across the families like, oh my gosh, I had no idea my mom was so far advanced with dementia. They hit it because as a couple, they do that. You know, they they hide things for each other. They help each other. You know, they, they don't want to let the family know what's going on. And then, of course... You know, if the caregiver passes, then all bets are off. You know, we see what's going on now. So to keep a caregiver from getting to that point, to keep them healthy, what are some things that you recommend, some tips that you give to caregivers not to neglect their own health? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's two issues. One is early as possible and the self-care issue regarding early as possible is be watching for the signs if you're a family member, especially for aging uh, parents or, or siblings, and try not to go into denial. I like to say, or don't like to say, I went to denial twice. Once was before the storm, the other was when she had to go into memory care. Oh, it's too early for that, isn't it? So, <laughs> and then saying, well, again, they're, they're getting older, they're, they'll be okay, they're just tired, or maybe they need a little tweaking in their medication. But It's important to watch for certain signs, educate yourself, have those conversations with the family, even if the parents won't let you in to the discussion or the legal or the financial or the responsibilities. We're fine. We've lived all by ourselves. We're independent. We we can handle it. But if you know something's definitely wrong, like mom's not cooking like she used to, or dad's repeating questions, or there are dents and scrapes on the brand new car, something's wrong. Those are mm-hmm. signs. And that's not the time to hide it or put it off. It's a time to have the discussion. And then re- whether it's the person who's the caregiver, like a, a spouse or another family member, the self-care is critical because, again, the statistics I mentioned earlier about too often they get sick, they get burned out, they get sick or worse. I like to use the example of uh, when I was going through that tough time with my uh, work and 
dealing with all the mom's issues was I got into the habit of going for a massage on a regular basis. And I like to say, I embellish on the phrase, self-care isn't selfish. It's vital. It's critical. It's critical. And I am so glad I at least did that. And fortunately, after mom passes away, that, that horrible boss retired and my stress level went from sky high to <laughs> perfect. <laughs> but I kept up that habit of getting a massage to this day because mm -hmm. I saw back then and still do that it wasn't a luxury. It was a necessity. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that one can do besides going to your own doctor and getting your own checkups and listening <laughs> and asking for support from other family members, neighbors, uh, ex-co-workers, friends, maybe a charitable organization nearby, because family can take on many definitions. And there are different ways of seeking support. It doesn't have to be the actual caregiving. It can be running errands. It could be handling the finances. It can be having somebody mow the lawn for you. Simple, simple things. Mm -hmm. But just ask for the help. And that's part of that self-care. So you don't get stressed out and burned out. And even during the pandemic, you can still get in your bathtub with some Epsom salts or some bubble bath, a candle and a glass of wine or some other beverage, whatever works for you. Ask somebody to watch your loved one for an hour or two and go have a cup of coffee or just go for a walk and, or read a book. Mm -hmm. Things like that will bring that stress level down and you'll feel better. Not go running errands necessarily for your loved one because you're still thinking about them. Yeah. Do something for yourself. I think some people, you know, they feel like they're being selfish to take care of themselves. And and it's not. It absolutely is not. You really no, need to not. take that time for yourself. And and also a lot of people I talk to, they feel like they have to control the everything around them, right? So they're controlling mm -hmm. everything so they cannot release even a little bit of it. And that's that's a huge mistake. You have to let others in and let others help you mm -hmm. and take some of the burden off of you. Right. And we all know that this is comparable to say, like when maybe somebody's passed away and people say, if you need anything, let me know, or how can I help? Sometimes they're not going to, the caregiver is not going to know or be hesitant to ask, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to burden anybody. And a couple of things are, have a list of all the different things you do. And if somebody says, how can I help? Hey, here's... Blah, blah. Can you pick up these prescriptions at the pharmacy for me? I'd really appreciate one less thing to mm -hmm. do. Uh, and maybe as a friend, if you're a friend or family member, neighbor of someone you know they're struggling, that they have a level with dementia, maybe you just say, pick up the phone. You know, I'm going to um, bring you dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. Just don't even ask. Don't even ask because a lot of times you ask, exactly. and people say, "No, no, I'm fine. I don't yeah. need anything." But, but you know, if you say, "I'm on my way to the store. I can get you milk. Whatever you know, whatever you need," and don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't feel like, "Oh, I don't need that." Ask, don't need to burden them. Hey, they've called you. I mean, if I call my neighbor and say, "I'm on my way to the store. What do you need? I want to get it for you." I, I want them to say, you know, tell me what they need. I want to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our neighbor, uh, my wife had a little incident. I won't get into it last past week. And she just came over with some flowers and, and, mm -hmm. and a little treat for us. And just it was a, just a nice little gesture. Yeah. You know, we certainly weren't expecting it. And we certainly mm -hmm. didn't ask for it. Another thing is besides people don't know what to do. And some people are hesitant to say anything. Sometimes you just need to ask. And I love this little story. When mom was in hospice, it was the last couple of weeks uh, at the care community. Coincidentally, it was a norovirus quarantine going on. Mm, so my, oh my aunt gosh. and I were the only ones who were in the building besides the residents and the staff. Care community is wonderful care. The coffee was terrible. And if you know anything about Portland, Oregon, we'd love our coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and I got on social media and said, will somebody please bring me a mocha? <laughs> two different friends from two different stands showed up with mochas for me. And I Still thank them to this day. Mm -hmm. And I tell them I use that example because it was wonderful. It was, all I had to do was ask. And I knew that somebody would probably come through. And they did. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, I mean, it's so simple to say, all you have to do is ask. And people need to do that. I mean, that's such a, like you said, such a simple thing, but it meant so much to you and still does, oh, obviously. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, that's wonderful. 
we talked a little bit earlier before we started the podcast about prevention and that there are some ways to I mean, there's no way to absolutely prevent because there's so much, you know, going on still with dementia, with research and everything. But there are some things we can do. And we've had people talk on the show about exercise and nutrition and different things that can help. What are some things that that you see that you think would would have maybe helped your mom, maybe prevented mm-hmm. Alzheimer's? Right. Let me preface that, that there are some things that present as dementia, such as polypharmacy, over-medication, mm-hmm. dehydration, UTIs. These are things that are reversible, not necessarily preventable, but they can be taken care of. Unfortunately, most types of dementia, there is still no cure or treatment. Again, we're getting close. As I can say, we're probably not going to be looking at a magic pill. It's probably some combination. But I like to use the example of my mother because we usually think in terms of genetics, and age. First, she was becoming symptomatic in her early 70s, which means she probably was developing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. I think back further, oh, that's what explains it with 2020 hindsight, why she was doing and saying those things. Uh, but when she got uh, further along, uh, yeah, she again, she was in her early 70s. The other factor of genetics, nobody else in my family, on my mother's side, has Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. A couple of my mm-hmm. older aunts may have a little mild cognitive impairment, but they're in their mid to late 80s, 90s. But there's increasing evidence of this, and my mom is a like the poster child. Mm-hmm. She's living on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi for 30 years. It has a tendency to have toxins, pollution, chemicals in the air, water, soil. She used to smoke. She never exercised, barely walked the dog to the corner, wouldn't get in a pool. There's kids in there. Okay. (laughs) She was, as I said earlier, she was in the caregiving role for my late stepfather. They were socially isolated a few miles off the Gulf Coast, the beach. And she was a professional artist. She was a printmaker in Taglio. She was etching into metal plates and putting it into an acid bath to do her prints. And this is like over 30 years. Wow. So there is increasing evidence, as you alluded to, environment and your behavioral and lifestyle choices. And the earlier that we can practice these or be in a safer, healthier environment and lifestyle, this will help prevent or at least delay or slow any progression. Again, mm-hmm. though, the earlier, the better. And that, mm-hmm. again, as you alluded to. It's exercise, it's nutrition, keeping physically, socially, and mentally active are real keys. And those are what mm-hmm. we're seeing in the, uh, in the research and what's coming out of Alzheimer's Association, various medical uh, facilities. And I mean, we have noticed, I mean, I think everyone has that after COVID, when people were so isolated, we saw such a decline. And so that social piece of it has a lot to do with it also. So many people who stayed in their homes, they didn't go out, they didn't interact, they just watched TV and sat there. They didn't get the exercise. They probably weren't getting good nutrition either and no socializing. We really saw it decline. Alzheimer's and other types of dementia are already challenging and tragic. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic just exacerbated all of that. Mm-hmm. Just, Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, it's a space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and going back to the nutrition, uh, you may have heard the two acronyms. One is SAD, Standard American Diet. And another one is CRAP, Stop Eating Crap. It's not just one word. It can be uh, an acronym. It roughly stands for the sweet carbonated drinks, the added mm-hmm. sugars, and artificial and processed foods. Stay mm-hmm. away from the junk food and the fast food. You can still have an occasional treat and enjoy some of the things you like, but not every meal every day and in huge portions. No. I'm not the first person to say this, the pandemic, we would have probably gotten through it a lot better if as a society, we've been a healthier mm-hmm. uh, population. And I think we can learn a lot of, from that in terms of uh, other conditions or epidemics. Yeah, absolutely. And with the aging population, you know, age is not the only factor. As you know, you don't necessarily are going to get dementia as you age. It just raises your risk level. It's mm-hmm. not a normal 
part of aging. And I think Francine, your recent guest, uh, talked about that quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. I know we talk about that a lot because people will say to me, oh, my mom is, you know, she's getting older. So yeah, she's, she has some dementia, kind of like it's a given. Well, it's, it's not a given (laughs) and people don't realize that not, I know, 97 year olds who are sharper, probably sharper than me. (laughs) So it's not a given just because you're a certain age that you are going to have dementia or Alzheimer's. So um, one of the things I point out is not just my mom, but also my dad. I rattle off all those reasons why we think mom got Alzheimer's. Uh, I don't have the same risk factors as either of my parents, but I'm still going to be very proactive. I want to have a long, active life. I retired from a unfulfilling, boring job after 25 years, a few years ago, but I want to keep doing what I'm doing for 25, 30 years. And there's Mm -hmm. no reason why I can't. We talk a lot on the podcast about mindset and passion and finding purpose. So just because you're retiring and you know you can't just go and sit down on the couch and do nothing, you need to find some sort of purpose because you have to have that in your life as well. You have to be still like, actively engaging your mind. And and I love that you're able to leave a job that was unsatisfying and follow something that's a passion for you, because I feel that is that is something that is that will keep your mind active and keep you from developing dementia or depression or different things that happen when people decide to retire. So, mm-hmm. all good stuff. I think the biggest thing that people say to me is, uh, I can't believe you're reti- so-called retired and you're the age that you are because you have a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. They don't see me just sitting around watch, just watching baseball. I'll do a little bit of that too, yeah. but not all the time. <laughs> well, I think it kind of like if you, you don't have energy, if you're sitting in front of the TV all the time, right? So you start having aches and pains if you're not getting up and moving your body. So I think that's why people you know, say, oh, you're so energetic. Well, I mean, you're energetic because you're you're doing something. <laughs> you're doing some. You're moving your body. You're using your mind, and and you're helping other people. So, but I do like to say that between my business and volunteer work and networking, building relationships, I'm as busy as I want to be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. (laughs) Yes. Well, I am so thankful to have you on the podcast and to share your story and your perspective. And uh, I know that you have your own business, your Cohen uh, Caregiving. And so how can people reach out to you and get information? Because I know you do a lot of education. Right. My website is partly my last name, Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, Cohen Caregiving Support.com. And a lot of the information and how to schedule an appointment, how I work, testimonials, uh, my blog are all on there. And uh, I believe I provided you things like our link tree mm-hmm. that has a lot of things, including my other podcasts and my blog and and other things that I do, including fundraising to find a cure with the walk to end Alzheimer's. Yeah, uh, this is my ninth year leading uh, Team Sheila, mm-hmm. and it's always uh, gratifying and a lot of fun to do. Great. That's wonderful. I'm glad that you've taken what you learned with your mom and that experience and turned it into something so positive to share with others. And we will have all your contact information, you know, along with the podcast, and then we'll be sharing it throughout on my website as well. So thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation. Well, great. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. Please feel free to share this episode with your friends and family. And you can find all of our podcasts on the website, which is lauriewilliams-seniorservices.com. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. 